Hello, and welcome to Security in Context. I'm Anita Fuentes, and today I am joined by special guest Vijay Prashad. Vijay is a historian, journalist, and executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and the author of 40 books, including Arab Spring, Libyan Winter, pub published in 2012. He is also the author of Tricontinental's recent newsletter titled NATO Destroyed Libya in 2011, Storm Daniel came to sweep up the remains, where he discussed the tragedy of the flood that struck the city of Derna in the aftermath of Storm Daniel and that resulted in the deaths of thousands of people. Hi, Vijay. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So your article starts by discussing the warnings of ordinary Libyans, such as the poet Mustafa al Trabelsi, about the neglect of Libyan infrastructure. Could you walk us through what happened, uh, how the Libyan authorities have handled the incident, and also how Libyan society is reacting to it, including calls for accountability? Well, the first thing to know is that Libya is a country of great wealth. Um, of course, oil wealth. Uh, which it has in abundance, particularly per capita oil wealth. It's not a very large population. It has a lot of very sweet oil right next to Europe, which it used to supply before the war in 2011. Um, secondly, Libya has no um, shortage of highly talented people. Over the course of the last 60 years, Libyan universities have generated very skilled people, engineers, um, lawyers, people with the capacity to build and maintain an administrative state. So it's not the question that it's a poor country and people just don't know how to build a dam. Okay, That is just not true. Uh, very highly skilled people and a lot of wealth in the country. So how is it possible that a rich country, rich in natural resources, with a skilled population was not able over the course of the past 10 years or so at least, um, to maintain basic infrastructure. Well, that's the first conundrum, let's say. The point here is that since 2011, Libya has had effectively two, if not multiple state administrations. That is to say, there are two recognized state administrations, recognized by different international forces, the government of national unity and the government of national stability. I say that there are many governments because even these governments don't necessarily exercise sovereignty over every single town, every single region. Um, the nature of the war in 2011 created a lot of dispersed power in different cities and towns, militias of Misrata, the you know religious forces in Derna, the city under um, you know the flood. Uh, these forces basically also took a lot of power away from a central administration. Um, what this meant was there was no planning capacity. You know, neither the government of national unity nor the government of national stability have been able to exercise the planning function. Um, firstly, oil revenues have collapsed for Libya, which means its principal resource is not generating enough revenue. And secondly, people with skills have either fled the country, which has been in chaos for the last 11, 12 years, uh, or they are simply demoralized. I mean, many people uh, have also been killed. Uh, a number of important uh, skilled professionals have died. Uh, in Benghazi, for instance, there have been assassinations of lawyers, of engineers, people who might have helped build a state and repair dams. So in the chaos, the very capacity of the state to act has been minimized. And strikingly, um, this has come in the issue of uh, things like water control. So a city like Derna, there are two dams which are of importance here. Um, there have been, you know, for the last 20 odd years, there have been calls for repair and, and, re and renewing of these dams. In fact, uh, the administration of Muammar al-Gaddafi had contracted a Turkish company um, to conduct the repairs. The Turkish company produced a, um, a document showing what it was going to do, the deal was struck, and so on. Um, and the Turkish company was prepared to start working on that dam in 2011. 
And then comes the war of 2011, of February, March 2011, the Turkish company decamps. Since then, uh, there's been utter amnesia about the fact that there was this urgency to repair the dam and a company had been contracted, utter amnesia. Um, the no administration acted on this. And, you know, this again doesn't come down to incompetence. This is the very wrong approach. A lot of the media coverage has suggested this is about incompetence. This is about something, you know, to do with poor countries and so on. Utterly, utterly erroneous form of reporting because there had been a company, a Turkish company contracted. It left because of the war. And these governments, these governments which are, in a sense, fragment of governments, not real governments. Um, they have parliaments, but they are not able to exercise their function. Again, the planning function, a main one. And therefore, the dams were never really um, had any upkeep. When the storm came, the storm was, of course, a considerable storm. It's not that the storm was negligible, but a refurbished dam might have held, at least might not have collapsed so entirely. It did collapse. Ten, you know, thousands of people died. Tens of thousands of people had their lives disrupted. Um, in fact, the poet uh, Altrabulsi died uh, after having written quite a beautiful poem. Um, this is the situation. And it's certainly not, you know, a tragedy, you know, of the natural kind. Um, this is a crime. Libya is a crime scene. Yes, um, I, I agree about the media coverage. I think, it, you know, the, the media is doing a poor job. And of course, there are interests involved in, in the kind of coverage that we're receiving, especially, you know, I, I would say in Western countries. And um, related to this, I think uh, your article also discusses what you see as the root causes and drivers of institutional deterioration and neglect, which you already started explaining. Uh, you're right that NATO's destruction of Libya set in motion a chain of events that culminated in the most recent tragedy, but there have been many before that. Uh, so could you briefly summarize those events and particularly how they led to the division of Libyan institutions and the consequences of those divisions in, in the Libyan people. You know, when um, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, pushed by France, which is not technically under NATO military command, and the United States, which effectively runs NATO military command, when NATO began the bombardment of Libya, um, it was very harsh. I mean, those of us who've covered these wars, Libya, Iraq, and so on, have directly seen the kind of, you know, what the US government directly calls shock and awe, um, the utter destruction of a society, the attack on infrastructure. In both Iraq and in Libya, the United States government attacked power plants, attacked bridges, attacked basic civilian infrastructure in the name of destroying the state. That's what they did in Iraq. That's what they did in Libya. Libya with ferocity. 9,000 airstrikes in Libya. Now, if you've ever been to Libya, you'll understand why 9,000 airstrikes sounds preposterous. Um, Libya is a country that is largely along the Mediterranean. There's an enormous desert going down to the city of Sabah, which is the gateway down into uh, the Sahara and the Sahel. But up alongside the Mediterranean, that's where most of the population lives. Between towns, it's largely either desert or it's, you know, grass. Um, you know, uh, Libya before the discovery of oil was a major exporter of grass to make paper. That was its principal export. And you can still see the grass growing on the side of the road as you drive along the Mediterranean. But when you leave, for instance, Sirte and enter the place between cities, there's really not much. There's there's not much of a large rural population. You know, these are small urban settings. There's villages and towns, but the big cities occupy the main, you know, uh, part of Libya. There are not 9,000 military targets, okay? There are military bases were there in Benghazi. There was a base out near Tobruk and, and, and Sirt. Um, there's a there was, of course, military facilities in Tripoli. Um, you know, there was even the small military airport, but there were not 9,600 targets. What was NATO bombing? I remember after this war, trying to harass NATO command saying, can you please tell us, what did you bomb in Libya? And they refused to hand over any details. In fact, 
when the United Nations asked NATO, uh, help us with your, uh, you know, understanding what were you doing bombing Libya? And by the way, NATO used a UN Security Council resolution, UN uh, Security Council resolution 1973 to prosecute the bombing so that the United Nations actually had a had a had a legal right to ask NATO to explain what the bombing was all about since the UN was provided as justification. NATO's lead attorney, Peter Olson, refused to answer the questions. And he said, NATO just doesn't conduct war crimes. That was where they left it, you know. But they destroyed infrastructure. You know, traveling in Libya after that immediate bombardment, you know, in 2012 was stunning because you could see infrastructure had been destroyed. You know, that was clear. Secondly, it was clear that the nature of the rebellion the you know the the militias of Misrata, the militias of Sirte, the militias of Benghazi, the return of various radical Islamist currents from Syria brought back you know um, into Libya at this time. Many of whom then went off to southern Algeria, down into Mali. They formed the um, the Al Qaeda of the Maghreb. You know those forces, you know ruthless forces. Um, they just refused to allow any reconstruction of the state. And there were naive, um, you know, people like Mahmoud Jibril, who used to be the financial advisor to the um, the former Emir of Qatar's wife. You know, Jibril was made the prime minister. This guy, naive, you know, no clue of how to run a state. In fact, you know, he was a good financial advisor, maybe, but you know, he couldn't pick up the pieces of things. He was a puppet of um, the Gulf Arabs of the United States and so on. They were outflanked, and in comes a general who had lived five minutes away from CIA headquarters in Langley since the 1980s, General Khalifa al Haftar. I mean, I revealed that he lived five minutes away from Langley during that war. My God, the attacks that came just for saying that. Um, you know, it was a simple matter. Where did Haftar come back from? Well, he, he put his house up for sale near, um, near Langley, you know, in in Virginia, and then he flew into Benghazi. And this was part of the chaos that was occasioned by the NATO war. This is not the chaos of, you know, the aftermath of Mr. Gaddafi. It was the chaos of the NATO war. And these forces, Jibril, you know, the fellows, the Muslim Brotherhood fellows who wanted their piece of the pie backed by the Turks, um, Khalifa Haftar backed by the Egyptians, maybe the Saudis, hard to say who was really backing him. It was civil chaos and has been so for 12 years. You know, just imagine that. This has been, a, it's a small country, Libya, in terms of population, but for a decade, it has not had a stable singular government. It has two official governments. Who is going to take responsibility um, for, you know, the needs of the people? Nobody. Everybody was basically cutting the pie. Corruption is rife, taking UN money, money that comes in, doesn't get down to the people. You know, whatever criticisms people might have, have of Mr. Gaddafi, and there are many that people share, you know, all over the place. Mr. Gaddafi um, produced a, a, a civilization in Libya where things seem to work. Things don't work now. And let me tell you, when his son, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, uh, said, I want to run for office, he was very popular going from town to town. And immediately court cases came up against him. They don't want to risk the return of the Gaddafi family. Um, they would prefer to allow Libya to rot in hell um, than to have a chance of something better. Lawfer. Um, so um, how do you assess the regional and international response uh, to the floods? And what are or should be the possible pathways forward given the entrenchment of the two different Libyan governments and uh, their backing by different states? Well, the first thing is, it must be said that regional countries really came through. You know, the Tunisians and others sent um, forces to come and help because the Libyan Red Cross and Red Crescent Society couldn't handle it. The state was not functional. I mean, look, uh, the, Gada the government insert sent the Minister of Aviation to have a look. Um, you know, he's a very capable person. They didn't send um, people in, in public, you know, works, administration and so on. 
um, they sent quite a you know efficient person i mean they needed regional help and regional help came you know including from egypt and so on uh, i don't want to minimize that it's very important that we remember that people did come in you know the tunisians sent what, what they could these are also poor countries they are not you know hugely rich countries but they contributed something or the other um, so there's that you're talking about the two governments the ben the cert government and the government in tripoli um who knows you know i don't want to come up with some plan that comes from mars say you know this is the way to solve it it's not look there are serious political differences in the world and libya is in a way a mirror of those differences there's the western let's say attempt to influence developments in libya it's not going very far you know not going very well uh, the turkish government since the um you know the uprising in tunisia um in 2010 since 2010 turkey has actually tried to have an expanded foreign policy across the mediterranean you know um, the so called neo ottoman foreign policy that was pushed at the time they have an entrenched interest in libya you know libya used to be part of the ottoman empire um the saudis have also their own interest um you know they have an interest that where basically their proxy is egypt uh, inside libya so different powers are pushing their own various regional international conflicts inside libya you know at one point it was a russian us conflict inside libya uh, the french play a duplicitous game as usual you know it's typical of france but what i'm saying is that libya like lebanon it's a very good parallel um will not be able to sort out its political problems look at lebanon lebanon has been in a political malaise uh, for decades you know decades and part of it is that different groups are backed by outsiders you know the so called christian faction backed by the french by the united states um you know the let's say the the shia faction backed by iran the sunni faction backed by the saudis you know lebanon has been paralyzed can't move a politics well i'm sorry to say that libya is lebanonizing uh, that's what seems to be happening is that different groups are being backed by different people the only difference is it's not on sectarian lines um that's largely because libya doesn't have that kind of sectarian makeup you know shia sunni christian and so on that's not the makeup the makeup is regional the makeup is to some extent quote unquote tribal you know there are differences of region that are playing up here but more than anything i must say it is a suitcase um it's a suitcase issue it's an issue of uh, suitcases breaking up a country what do i mean by that is a lot of money exchanging hands to different people coming from outside powers the country is paralyzed by this and it is therefore uh, impossible for me or you to say how to fix this you know i mean there's no way and inside libya just as in in lebanon to some extent although lebanon is much more advanced in this problem uh, inside libya there are no political forces that are going to easily be able to bring things together uh, they just don't exist now in fact i would say that mr saif al islam gaddafi um, was actually for a moment looking like somebody who could you know bring different groups together but he's also deeply polarizing for good reason uh, he's the son of muammar al gaddafi um but there is a nostalgia growing in the country you know during gaddafi's period it was better which it was um there's that nostalgia growing i don't know where the door will open but i very much hope a door will open and the suitcases will all be destroyed so i would like to end with your final thoughts on what are the broader lessons from incidents like the storm daniel flood uh both about militarism and intervention as well as climate change uh what are your thoughts well we know that when the united states intervenes and in this case also france when they intervene they don't intervene for humanitarian reasons they intervene for political interest um you know you don't bomb infrastructure destroy power plants for humanitarian reasons you know uh, you don't do that um during the lead up to the war the african union was running a very very credible peace negotiation between jibril in benghazi and gaddafi in tripoli uh, the au had come to libya 
Uh, they had talked to the parties even during the war. Um, the AU African Union had sent um, you know delegates to talk to everybody. There was always the possibility of a deal. In Iraq, if you go back and look at it, in 2002-2003, Saddam Hussein was desperate for a deal with the United States. You know, um, he wanted a deal. He may even have left office. Okay, he was that desperate for a deal. Um, in Afghanistan, the Taliban in 2001 were begging powers like the Pakistanis and others, tell the Americans, don't bomb us because they'll destroy civilian infrastructure. We'll hand over Osama bin Laden. Not to them, though. We want to hand him over to a Muslim country. That was their, you know, extradition policy. Um, but so militarism of this kind, this vicious destruction of civilian infrastructure is never a good idea. Look at how the Israelis are treating Gaza. Anytime the people, the Palestinians in Gaza build anything, you know, some cement factory or anything, Israel comes in and bombs it, you know, bombs power plants, bombs water purification plants, ruthless destruction of infrastructure. That is the militarism of the West. That's how the West conducts its wars, you know, the Israelis included. Um, and therefore militarism should never be confused, uh, you know, this particularly this Western bombardment, never be confused with humanitarianism. I found it depressing, to be quite honest with you, in 2011, to see reasonable, sensitive people back the NATO intervention in Libya, saying, yes, you know, because Gaddafi is going to conduct genocide. That was nonsense then, and it has since been proved to be nonsense. Many human rights organizations, Amnesty International, in the lead, did after-war studies, which none of these liberal, sensitive people have paid attention to. But Donatella Rovera of Amnesty visited places where there had been claims of genocide. And she said she found none, that this was concocted particularly by the Saudis. Uh, Al Arabiya was running article after article saying that there's genocide happening. In fact, when I interviewed the UN Secretariat just before UN Resolution 1973, I asked them, how do you know there's genocide in Libya? You don't have anybody on the ground. Um, you don't have access to the cities of Benghazi or, you know, um, the lead, the cities, Ajtabia, that go up to Benghazi. You don't have access. How do you know? Well, they said from press reports. Well, which press are you referring to? Well, Al Arabiya. Al Arabiya is the basically the mouthpiece of the royal family of Saudi Arabia. And, you know, the king at the time hated Gaddafi because Gaddafi used to directly insult him in Arab League meetings. He would say things like, you are a creature of the British. You are a dog of the Americans. They hated him personally. Um, this was no reason to go and bomb that country so viciously. I was dismayed to see liberal, sensitive people, you know, saying, well, you know, it's a good thing. Got to stop the genocide. Humanitarian, inter what humanitarian intervention? This is not a humanitarian intervention. It was a destruction a willful, deliberate destruction of the Libyan state, which has never recovered and therefore cannot protect itself against floods uh, occasioned by Storm Daniel. Well, uh, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add uh, to end, maybe on a more positive note, if, if that's possible, maybe not. Well, the positive note is I hope very much that the next time um, United States and NATO come selling a bag of goods about humanitarian this or that, people would be a little more skeptical of them. And I'm not talking about the reasons to you know, go into a country. I'm talking about how they go into a country. How they go into a country is what they call shock and awe in Iraq, you know, vicious, um, you know, sadistic bombardment of civilian infrastructure. Um, how can anybody be surprised about what happens next? Look at Iraq. I mean, the country is barely recovered from the destruction of infrastructure. Power cuts continue. Um, you know, civilian life is difficult in Iraq even today. This is a great country, a great civilization. It did not deserve the kind of whacking it got from the global mafia led by the United States. BJ, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks a lot.